Well, this is what America wanted. They wanted young Craigers to do a podcast, and the Giving Back Tour continues. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mr. Craig Kilborn. Some of my friends call me Lord Kilby. Others just call me Young Craigers. And this is my podcast, The Life Gorgeous. The Life Gorgeous. It's taking my positive energy from my Instagram and transferring it into the spoken word. With The Life Gorgeous, I'll be sharing my glorious life in hopes of improving your life. On every episode, I'll be answering your questions. We'll do that at the end of this episode. If you want to leave a question, go to my YouTube channel, Sir Craig Kilborn. Subscribe, leave a voicemail, ask a question. Today's guest, an old friend, Ryan Rossillo, podcast sensation from The Ringer, used to work at ESPN. He's buff. He's a good kid. We're going to talk about my lighting, and we're going to talk about the Rudy Gobert trade. And I went easy on him, but I straightened his ass out. It's a hell of a trade by the Wolves. Very proud of the Wolves. <sighs> Let's enjoy the interview right now, and we are dissolving. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ryan Rossillo. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. You know, there was a time where I thought I would get a little ahead of uh, my pursuit to fame and maybe I'd be sitting next to you on a, on a set of a TV show, but this feels so much more personal. It right. feels like it's, it's, it just, it feels like it means more, even if, if, you know, it's not CBS. Uh, well, thank you. This is the Life Gorgeous podcast. I share my magical life in hopes of improving the lives of others. One of the, this is uh, either the first podcast or the second podcast. So you're in the top two. Depends on the schedule of Minnesota Timberwolves head coach, Chris Finch. Finchy. I saw Finch all week at Vegas. I mean, he's, I couldn't stop running into him. <laughs> he's a great guy. You, uh, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that. And also we're going to, we're going to wait. We're going to talk about the Rudy Gobert trade. And let me just warm up for it by saying this. Hey, Danny Ainge, how do you do that trade and not get Jaden McDaniels? What are you thinking? How do you sleep at night, Danny Ainge? But we're not there yet. And I'm going to go easy on you and Bill for your just unprofessional take on that trade. But we'll, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So it's great to see you. This is my mahogany panel, Dan. This is the Life Gorgeous. What do you think of the lighting? I know you wanted to talk about that. I sent you a still. What do you think of the lighting? It's warm. Comforting. It's really warm. Comforting. It's, uh, it, it, it makes me think of, of Teddy Roosevelt at Sagamore, perhaps just planning his next move <laughs> in the den. <laughs> I want you to feel safe, Ryan. I want you to feel safe and comforted. I do. I mean, I'm I'm pretty ham and egg over here. People think this is my my real bedroom. I'm like, you know, they have another bedrooms bedrooms. They're called masters. Yeah. But uh, this is just this is just where we film the content. Did I sleep in that bedroom? I don't think so. I went home that night. I went down and had drinks at your pad. Are we able to say where you live, or do you want to keep it private? No, everybody it's quite knows a, I live here. Yeah, it's quite an enclave. It's Manhattan Beach. You run into a lot of people. They have, I think, uh, Durant has a place. Uh, Kevin Durant has a place down there. Mark Cuban. Steve your Nash boy, is down the street. Your boy, Steve Nash. Can I give you some useless trivia? This is, you, you may not find this interesting. So I, I know Nashy. We all, he's a super nice guy. And we used to hang out and we had dinner one night. And one of his friends from Canada, a hockey player, you might not know, named Russ Courtnall. Ever heard that name? Russ Courtnall. I do know the name. I okay. do know the name. So Russ Courtnall married a woman who was the daughter of Sarah Vaughn. Now, you have you ever heard of Sarah Vaughn? You might not be old enough to know Sarah Vaughn. The artist? Uh, the She's just, a singer. She singer, was yeah. 
maybe the greatest jazz singer of all time, better than Billie Holiday. She was a, she was a classically trained in opera, and then she sang jazz. Sarah Vaughan's daughter married Russ Courtnall, and I met Russ that night with Steve Nash, really nice guy, Russ Courtnall. Their daughter is Allie Courtnall, who is a stunning model, has been in Sports Illustrated, and she just got married to one of my two favorite Minnesota Vikings. It comes full circle. My favorite Vikings are both on the defense because I'm a defensive stalwart. Hitman Harry Harrison Smith. The guy she married is Eric Kendricks. Hitman Harrison Smith. We have been scheduled efforting to get him on the podcast. He's a, he's a great. Okay, he's a great guest. He he's really honest and he has a, he has a kind of a quirky sense of humor and you would you would like him, and he's he's my favorite man. What was it about your game? That was defense first, protection well, I was, of the rim. I was being facetious because I say I'm the poor man's pistol. Do you think Pistol Pete Maravich really cared about taking a charge and got giddy over taking a charge? No, not at all. That's why I brought <laughs> it up. Because I don't remember. I have a scattering report on you from back in the day. Because we were looking <laughs> at undrafted potential signees in Bosnia. And you came up on a list and I was like, wait, defense first. That's not the that's not, unless you had pivoted later in life to understanding your role, which a lot of us have a hard time do accepting our role as we age. Well, when I, I was a, a great shooter, I was a pure shooter and I, I shot 45 percent on three pointers at the Big Sky Country, uh, the Big Sky Conference in in limited playing time. I was nine for 20 for the year. And we had the longest three-pointer in 1982. It was 22 feet, much longer than the ACC, where Mark Price is pulling up inside the top of the key. But That's right. The I, ACC, it was inside. It actually it, cut no, off no, the top he of the would, key. Mark Price would dribble down and just pull up, right? I mean, why not? <laughs> I mean, it was a joke. Uh, it's I don't so even, funny. If you, see, if you see pictures of it, it was like, did you think you had 11-year-olds playing in the ACC? <laughs> like, what? What what adult went? That's too far for those how, kids. How old were you in eighty two? Eighty two, I was seven. Okay, because oh my god, is that true? That's a joke. That's a joke, right? I don't even know how old you are, but you seem you seem youthful. Well, people can't figure it out with me because sometimes right. I'll tell people how old I am, and they're like, "You're that old?" I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, right. what's going on? Maybe you should start right. trying to, maybe you should start lying about your age, the way you dress, the way you carry yourself. And right. I go, well, wait a minute. Does this mean I'm some fraud who's like the old guy hanging out? Like, you know, again, nothing against Jimmy Goldstein, but I'm just sitting there going, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. What are you, what are you saying? And then sometimes right. I take it as a compliment. Like my agent even one time was like, well, you still have plenty of time. You're not even 40. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not 40. We're already halfway there, buddy. So oh my go God. Oh my God. Random thoughts. This happens, unfortunately. You mentioned Jimmy Goldstein. How many pairs of leather pants do you own, Ryan Rosillo? One. Haven't worn them yet. Okay. Wait, you just got them or not? <laughs> Felt like I'll do this one night. Haven't done it. I want you to wear them and run into Nashi in Manhattan Beach. And, just and shirt off. Yeah. Just down. Because <laughs> when Kilborn came over to my house, I answered the door and he's like, can I park here? I was like, yeah, no problem. And second question is, are, are you going to wear a shirt at any point tonight? Yeah, you, you're, you had, you're buff and you like to show it off. And I need, I'm not necessarily comfortable it with a male not having a shirt on unless his name is Morrissey. But that's another story. So <laughs> I, I just want to go back. Tell me if you think this is funny. You mentioned uh, there was a scouting report on me. Did you know I played with a touring team in Europe out of college. And, and when I graduated from Montana State, I moved to San Francisco with my brother, my favorite city in America, and most European, European city in America. But I got this chance to play with the touring basketball team in Europe. And it was supposed to be like an athletes in action. The two guys that ran it were supposed to, you know, you were supposed to be a Christian. And I grew up in the, you know, going to church and everything. And, but I wasn't, I'm non-religious, I'm agnostic, but I wanted to play ball, man. And it was funny because the guys on the team, there were different levels. There were some hardcore Christians and there the, mo the rest of us. One guy had the, uh, the penthouse with Madonna in it. She was nude. These were art, arty nudes from when she was really young. Pictures, and, not physically her. Yeah. The pen, yeah, the penthouse magazine. Well, it wasn't the NBA. So that would have felt weird. You know, why yeah, she hanging yeah. out with this guy in this Christian so, league. So we're, we're just touring in Europe, uh, with this team. 
And I flew out of Stuttgart. I flew Tower Air from San Francisco for $200. And I got there and, and everyone else flew into Geneva. And I had to take a train up to Geneva. Long story short, they all flew out at the end of the tour. I was back in Stuttgart. I was staying with an American ball player. And he said, my buddy run, you know, runs some of these teams. And he has a place for an American to play on a team in Luxembourg. And they will give you free food, a free apartment, a free car, and $700 a month or $600 a month, whatever it was. And it's my really my only regret because I, I would have had fun, but I, I went back to because I said, I got to get a job in TV. I'm out of college, blah, blah, blah. But I said, he's never seen me play. The guy said, you're an American. You'll average 27 points a game. <laughs> I mean, that would have been a blast, man, right? <laughs> I can't believe you were that focused knowing, you know, again, knowing you casually, you're a worldly man, which is sort of the point of this podcast. Yeah. I can't believe you didn't give yourself one year in Luxembourg. I know you're a hundred percent right. I was, I think I was also, I felt maybe I felt it was irresponsible. If they would have offered me $800 done deal. No, I'm just kidding. But anyways, um, I did want to, I'm going to cover a lot of topics. So just stay with me as you always do. What about you know, follow-ups though? What yes, about follow-ups? I know absolutely. it's your podcast. I just have one yes. minor one because yes. ever since the sports center ad where you talk junk, I know you don't like swearing, so I'm going to do my best here. Um, people wondered, is that in his game? Is that because it felt very natural. You are a great which, actor, but it, which one are we talking felt, about? Where you were like, the guy was complaining when you were playing Bristol plumbing and you were just letting yeah. it rain on him. Uh, and what was your question? Did I did I use profanity or what did you say? No, no, it, not profanity, but there was an edge that you had. I'm just wondering if oh, you're getting 27 yeah. a game in Luxembourg, were you going to let the opponents no. know? Were you going to let the opponents know? My favorite, no, I that was for the that was for the commercial. They wanted me to say, "Keep your mouth shut, Plumber Boy," or whatever I said. I yeah. said something to Plumber Boy. It was uh, Cohen, uh, the, the producer. I can't remember his first name at, at this point. Eric Cohen. No, I don't remember his first name. But uh, yeah, so that was. I made a great no look to Jawan Howard. But I didn't talk trash. I was quiet. My favorite player uh, growing up early was Walt Frazier, no expression. And then it was Dr. J. So I'm not the trash talk. I enjoy hearing stories of, of Scott Skiles in college telling Georgetown and John Thompson, none of these guys can guard me to the bench. Or he said when they were playing <laughs> Michigan to Antoine Jobert, you can't guard me, fat boy. I mean, that stuff, I like hearing about that. But that's but not do your, it. but right. Okay. I just want to clear that up for the audience. It's been years. So you know this, I love your voice and I say it all the time. It's probably your greatest attribute. Some of the things you say, I like to, too, but, not my but looks. Do, no, do you, do you get that a lot that you have a great voice? Well, it's funny that you brought up Stuttgart because I'm classically trained as a singer. I'm a bass too. Are you joking and right now? Tell me you're joking. No, no. In high school, I was, it was incredible. And so I made this <laughs> Wait a group second. and I... we, yeah, yeah. We, we went and toured Germany. I stayed in Oberbeugen where the, most of the other kids were stationed in Benglingen. Um, and it's an incredible story. I was actually telling it recently because when I showed up, I was 17. We're, we landed in Amsterdam and all the adults and chaperones were yelling at us that we were falling asleep because it was my first time ever on a flight. I think I was 17 years old. And, uh, you know, we get to, we get to Stuttgart and we're waiting to be picked up by the host families. And I was like the only one that I was like, well, where, who am I staying with? Like everybody's getting paired up in this group. And they're like, oh, we kind of screwed up on the host thing. You're by yourself and you're in a town called Oberbeugen. And I was like, oh man, this sucks. And so I got a phone number from my other buddies. I was like, where are you? They're like, I guess we're downtown with these old people. And they leave in a Mercedes. I call them from the house phone. They're like, what's going on over there? They're like, we're already drunk. They don't know that we're not allowed to drink in the States. And this is the best ever. We're going to walk to this bar later. They're like, what are, are you? you doing? How old are you? I was you? 17. So, okay. you know, at that point, we're drinking a little. And so, like, I, I call. They're like, what are you doing? I go, dude, I'm in a village like 30 minutes away throwing a stick with a nine-year-old kid named Yentz. <laughs> Like this sucks. It's turned out everything came back. Uh, everything turned out for me. Great. And then we would do these events. We would sing in these old German halls. We go up to Heidelberg and we would do this stuff. We were doing like Requiem. We were doing some really heavy, heavy stuff. So um, I'm, I'm lucky that the voice, the voice was there wow. in the beginning when I was a skinny little kid and, and it stayed as, as I filled out a little bit as I got older. Do, do people know this story? Do people know like your friends and the people at ESPN, did they know you were a singer at growing up? Probably not. 
Wow. Yeah, probably not. That's like if I do Johnny, Ca- if I do Johnny Cash at karaoke, like dishwashers will come out from back and be like, "Whoa." Oh, so what's you're going are on? you are you really good at dishwashing? You know, at the karaoke dishwashing. I did do that too <laughs> no, once. I'm just but, saying. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. I don't do it. I don't do it that often because I've always had kind of an issue with somebody at karaoke who's like really good at it. Yeah, because you know, Craig, we know this. We've both been on TV for years. I don't need it. I don't need that right. attention. Well, I have I have writer friends that have nice voices. I actually can't I can't sing, but I love music. I, I mean, I have a nice voice. I sing off key, and um, I can sing while I'm dishwashing or showering and washing myself. But uh, I didn't know that about you. That's you can't do any you can't do any uh, like what would I have you do? You can't say sing a bar of Wichita Lineman, which is a great song. No, maybe if I, I were a, a little I bit more. I am a lineman up. for the county. I am a lineman. Maybe a little uh, red light, blue light, Harry Connick would be my, you know, I think that's a good range for me. How does that go? I don't, I haven't done it in years. I mean, we're talking like years. I wouldn't, I wouldn't break this out unless we were like, you know, college or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I feel comfortable. I don't know if this is the right microphone even. That's fine. The next time you wear the leather pants and, and we'll do the singing. I mean, we don't have to even see the leather pants, just wear the leather pants. We'll sing. I did want to ask you, I did have this as one of my notes, because I, I don't know, I know you, but I don't know you, but, and I actually don't even know how old you are, because that, that's an age gap when it comes to music. But like, what was your favorite band in high school or in college? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this is a great, great one, because, um, you know, my dad was was very into music. You know, you work in construction outside. He, he started as a very modest bricklayer, brick walks. And as a little kid, I would be on the job site handing him bricks, you know, making my $5 a day. And it was East it Coast. Was all the, yeah, East Coast. I mean, Almond Brothers, I would grow up on that. Right. Um, Stones. We were big in a ZZ Top, mm-hmm. you know, police, all that kind of stuff. So you're starting, you're, you're identifying like what your musical tastes are versus like what's popular and kind of what you love. Go ahead. Did you play an instrument or play piano or guitar or drums or anything? No. The only thing I, I taught myself how to do it because my father did it uh, from back in his days is I, I learned how to play harmonica, which isn't that oh. hard because if yeah. you just figure out the key and you have a decent ear, right, uh, you can kind of figure it out. But really, most people are just you have the right key and you're blowing in and out of it. And if you just sort of figure it out, you can do it. So I, I got to a point where I was OK at it and then I just stopped doing it. It become like a party favor in college. Like I could play a couple songs that. OK, but I just recently I started in um, March. I bought an acoustic guitar. I love Leo Kaki. And then I kind of went reverse and I started realizing I like John Fahey even more than Kaki. And so Kaki has that classic, you know, six and 12 string guitar, the armadillo on the cover. You know, everybody kind of knows about this record, uh, Machine Gun Vaseline, Vaseline Machine Gun, whatever. And I went, was like, okay, so who influenced Kaki? And then I started listening to Fahey and researching him and his music's so much more emotional. It's incredible stuff. So I have spent the last four months watching videos, teaching myself, and I've learned oh, how to play two songs. That's Because I was so annoyed. I was so annoyed that I didn't know how to do it, how much I loved the way he played. And again, right. what he's doing is absurd. The finger picking part of it, the tunings that you have to learn, which isn't that hard, but that has just started this year because I was tired of not knowing how to do it. So that that's very, I'm being on, that's very impressive. I like when people do that. My brother is, is playing guitar. He, he took three years of piano growing up. My mom was a piano teacher as well as a teacher, but um, I didn't have the discipline. I was just working on my jump shot and my game, but I, I love music and I love talking about music. And I actually don't know, I've heard the names you mentioned, but I don't know them. So you, uh, before I forget, I, where did you grow up? What city did you grow up in or did you move around? I was born in Hartford, um, which, you know, was why ESPN was always in the crosshairs, right, for me, because I was like, I need to get back. I need to right. get back one day. Um, and it was funny because at work once I made fun of Hartford and then somebody was like, you probably shouldn't make fun of Hartford. I was like, I was actually born in Hartford Hospital, so I think it should be allowed <laughs> you're, to. You're allowed to, yeah. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm allowed to. And then I even lived in there where they got the fancy high rises that didn't necessarily I, work I, That's out. where people made fun of me when I moved there. I moved from Carmel by the sea. I was working in Salinas, Monterey. But I loved living in Carmel and on the weekend, not using my car, just walking around the village. So when I moved to ESPN, I lived in Hartford. I was the only guy. It was kind of a ghost town, but I lived in an IMP building and I lived on the top floor, which is sixth floor overlooking the park. And I'd go to Congress Rotisserie and get a sandwich. I, I, Tariko took me to the Whalers game at the Civic Center. We ate at Ruth's Chris. So it, I just like walking around. But it was when I was there in the 90s, it was a bit of a ghost town. It was still a ghost town when I was there. It was like the one street. So I thought it was okay. And then when um, when I was just starting out in high school, about a year in, my family moved to Martha's Vineyard. 
And I know what Whoa. everybody thinks. Uh, right, exactly. Very, uh, I think you probably say Tony, maybe. I don't know. Um, here's the deal about Martha's Vineyard. If you live there, if you're a year-round person that's living there, um, you, you're probably more likely to be blue collar than you are somebody who's like borderline doesn't need to work. You know, so my father went from brick walks to, you know, I remember decks. And then I remember, never forget, like you got this, this big addition and it was the first right. time you ever got an addition. And like, you know, financially the family was like, oh, we're, we're in a good spot now, you know, like things are coming along. Um, he had randomly bought a piece of property. Uh, it tripled in 12 months. So he was like, all right, great investment. I want to build a house and live on Martha's Vineyard and, and raise my family there. So I'm the oldest of five. So I feel like I'm from Martha's Vineyard. They've been there 30 years. Uh, most of my siblings went through school there. I did not. I didn't appreciate it enough when I was younger because I, you know, I'm a high school kid and I, as soon as right. I could leave and go to Vermont, I wanted to get out of there because it was a did really- Did it seem, right. Did it seem boring? Is it a resort area? Oh, yeah. Did, no, it's it seemed, so boring. But that's what people said about Carmel by the Sea. And the locals, a lot of them worked in the restaurants and they were bartenders, but there was a loneliness for some of the locals if they didn't have a mate. And but it's a resort town. And there I'm going to name drop because I'm allowed to. But John Cleese, we used to talk and, and he had a place in Santa Barbara and I hung out with him and he didn't like Carmel because he said, I don't like resort towns. They don't have a soul because yeah, there are not enough local people there. It's just people, visitors, the tourists. Is that what Martha Vineyards is like as far as Martha, you know? Yeah, I also think part of it is two people wanting to escape and wanting to get away from it, too, and enjoying that. But the vineyard year round, I mean, it was still over 10,000 people. I think it's 14,000 people now. My high school class is on 100 people in it. Right. Um, it's more diverse than you would ever think. Uh, it's six towns, so it's actually a lot bigger. It's like three sides of the time or three times the size of Nantucket. But it, for a high school kid, like you'd find a place you go drink in the woods and then other kids that would graduate from high school would want to come beat you up because then they realize like, oh. If I haven't left or I haven't gone to college, like I don't have a ton to do. So I'll crash right. these high school kids' parties. And then, you know, sometimes there'd be a bonfire with poison ivy in it. And then people coming to school on Monday with poison right, ivy right. all over the face. You know, a lot of lot of a lot of stuff to so when Cleese, when John Cleese, excuse me, says something like that, I don't know if that's specific to Carmel or not, but I'd well, argue he, there was he, yeah, he yeah. he knew I was I was at the dinner table talking about Carmel and his wife at the time, it was his third wife, and she was a therapist. Uh she said, um, she said something at dinner. She goes, you don't need to go to therapy because you don't want it. You're fine and you don't want to change. She said that to me, <laughs> Seriously, which I enjoyed. But, 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 here's, but here's, wait. I have a follow up, though. Go ahead. On what do you think it is about your ability? I just finished reading uh, Bob Evans, the, the legendary Paramount producer's biography. Well, the kid stays in the picture. He's my he was my old friend. We used to have we used to hang out. Go, go ahead. I'll. Okay, Go. now now the entire you're gonna have to come on my podcast. I'm gonna spend an hour on this. Uh, the, yeah. the biography could have ended after 30 pages, and I would have been good. Right. That's how that's how incredible no, he, this guy's life. He's is. a legend. Have you seen the offer yet on Paramount Plus? That's the, the whole making... reason why I went back and bought the book because I watched Matthew Good's character. I cannot Unbel believe he, he, he nailed he nailed Bob Evans. He nailed Bob Evans, and I was freaking out. And my favorite line was when he went down to Texas to visit Ali McGraw shooting the Getaway with Steve McQueen and she wouldn't open the motel room door. She was surprised. And he goes, what's going on? Wait, open the door. Is McQueen in there? Are you effing the blob? You know, I just, that was magic. Cause I also okay, like the blob, this... the movie, the blob, which is probably before your time. Uh, it is, but I am yes. aware of it. Here's okay. Here's what I'm where the connection that I'm making. And I didn't even know that you were friends. And now this makes sense. We lost John Cleese, by the way, we were now off of, uh, unless we rally come, circle back, but go ahead. Bob Evans. This is uh, like like a late '90s Seinfeld. Like yeah, like a late '90s Seinfeld. Just bring it yeah. back around. Um, what do you think it is about your ability over your years, much like a Bob Evans? And Evans, you could argue maybe had more power because of his position, as opposed <laughs> to you were facing the camera. You one could argue, but your ability to weave celebrity, your ab your ability to weave in and out of it, to have. To have the people that normally always worry, oh, is this guy gonna, you know, I, I think you you're you've always been great at it. With what? With with doing what? I Hanging just out like with people these guys like you. Or, yeah. Well, oh, the old like school you. guy. Well, the old school guys love me because they could tell I was a little bit old school. I really appreciated. Like I knew Merv Griffin, he was great. I appreciated, uh, I think it was my dad turned me on to the old movies. I love old movies. You'll see that when we do our top five movies of all time, which is coming up. Uh, and, and Bob Evans, I mean, I was, I was eating dinner one night. I can tell this, this podcast, I, I, I like to be organized. I can tell this might go long, but that's okay. I'm having a good time. Uh, uh, but basically I was having dinner 
at a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard. I think it's closed now, but it's very popular called Il Soleil, I believe was the name. I was there with my then girlfriend who was visiting from New York and I had my back to the door and somebody entered, people entered the door and she goes, oh, freak alert, freak alert, 12 o'clock. And I turned around and it was Bob Evans, who I had not yet met, and Jean-Claude Van Damme. And they sat down and they saw me and they said hi, because they had watched the show, but I'd never met either of them. And then my uh, girlfriend went to the ladies' room and I said to Jean-Claude Van Damme, I said, when she sits back down, I want you to say, kind of in a whisper, do you remember me? We spent an hour at the Four Seasons Hotel. Do you remember me? Like, like he had a fling with her. I wanted her, him to do a practical joke. She sits down, he says the line, and she goes, Craig, knock it off. Because Van Damme cannot act. That's why. But anyways, and then Bob and I became friends after that. We became friends after that. And I, I watched the kid stays in the picture in his screening room at his house. And we had dinner many times. And I have stories about that. I'll tell you one quick story. And I apologize. I'm gonna, I'll tell it on your podcast, too. And there's one story I can't tell here. And I will ask you to help me tell it on your podcast because it's a little I have to work a little dirty, a little blue. But this one is I've told this on a few. Um, we would go out for dinner uh, to the Palm or Spago. I'd bring my girlfriend. He'd bring a girl. And then at the end of dinner, he goes, you guys want dessert? And we say, no, we're fine. He goes, let's go. Let's go. Meaning let's just walk out without paying. He would not pay for dinner at these places. They would send him a bill later. It was very freeing for him just to walk out of the restaurant. And at Spago, they, the young waiter was going, what's going on? And, and Wolfgang goes, it's okay. It's okay. Now, we believe that they sent the bill to Sumner Redstone, who was the head of Paramount and CBS, because Bob and, Bob and Sumner were friends, and he had made so much money for Paramount with The Godfather. So Bob Evans... Carte Blanche eating around, you know, eating around Hollywood and Beverly Hills. That's kind of fun, right? Yeah, that's really fun. Because it's also when you read, you know, you get through his the full scope of his story. And as he's making fun of himself, it's one of the best biographies I've ever read because he's this impressive. I mean, he's impressive from every angle. Yes. His life is 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 make believe. Yeah. Uh, yet he's incredibly self-deprecating throughout making fun yeah. of himself, calling yeah. out all of his mistakes. And unfortunately, a lot of financial mistakes. And I wonder if towards the end, it's he's basically in the book going like, you know, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have done that. You know, mistakes that we all kind of make, but his were, you know, to the level of making Paramount all of this money and then him going, how come I don't have a piece of any of this stuff? I just wonder if that was something that was kind of understood towards the end, because he even says in the book, I'm writing this book to pay back taxes. Yeah, it's I don't know his full situation. I do know he had to give up. He, he loved his home and he had a special home and they kind of captured it. And you got to go there all the you time. You got to go there all right? the time. Gosh. One of my stories is about that. That's the story I want to tell you. Uh, but anyways, uh, he did lose his house financially. He lost his house. And the story is he got it back because a friend of his knew he needed it. He, his friend said for his soul, I got to get a, this house back for him. And his friend is named Jack Nicholson. Bought it, bought the home back for him. Yeah. So anyways, yep. we could go on and on about Bob Evans. He's one of my, he's a real character. He's an odd guy, you know, he, but we, he was, he gave me some of his eyeglasses. I mean, he was, he was a great, he was just a great guy. He was very sweet. And he, and he, and he, you know, I interviewed him a few times and I did a pre-tape with him on my very last show. He, he was a great guy. So, but let, back to Ryan Rossillo. You mentioned, okay. you mentioned John Cleese. I had at dinner, I, they lived in Santa Barbara and uh, John Cleese and his then wife and other, he had other places, but I mentioned how much I like Carmel and his wife said, yeah, I used to, I used to date or marry. I was married to a, a golfer who had a place in Carmel and Carmel is more beautiful than Santa Barbara, but John doesn't, John doesn't like those kind of resort towns. There's not enough local people or it's too many tourists. That's, that's how that came up to answer your question. Full circle. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember. I remember that part. I, I screwed up his last name a couple of times, too. Um, are we ready to do my thing with Rudy Gobert? Can I have some fun with you, buddy? Yeah, please. Because okay. I'm there will be nothing you can say that will change my mind. But I can't That's, I'm not trying to try. change your mind. I just there were people that heard you and Bill Simmons talk about it. And I had they would say, do they follow the Timberwolves? Do they know what's going on? And but there was anger from you towards Rudy. And I said, it's personal. Did Rudy do something that like a, with one of 
Brian's girlfriends or what the hell? It was really, and I almost, and this is interesting. French guys. I almost reported you guys, you and Bill to the FCC for just being reckless and irresponsible with that podcast. You guys were going overboard. How does this, how is this passion? Do you like this? Is this I do. I love okay. it. Keep going. So I was, uh, you, you seem really upset, but I'm going to go point by point on a couple things I disagree with. Okay. I got a pen. Okay. Go ahead. Do you know that there are small market teams in the NBA and it's really hard to get free agents up there or players up there. And if we draft them, Stefan Marbury, Kevin Love, they want to leave. Do you know that Minnesota is the coldest market in the NBA? It's hard to get people there. Thank God KG wanted to stay. Thank God Carl Anthony Towns wants to stay. It's not easy to get guys up there. So. I know those things, but I'm writing them down. Okay. Cold. Do you also know. Now, I'm not going to defend the trade and the draft picks. I don't care about the players. My joke is, how does Danny Ainge do this without getting Jaden McDaniels? That's why you had to add another draft pick. But. I'm not going to defend that because th- when I heard the De- Jonte Murray was going to be a trade with three first round picks, I don't like giving up first round picks, but I do realize now that they oftentimes don't turn out to be very, very good. We've made a, the Wolves, all teams have made mistakes. We had the Johnny Flynn, we had the Jamal Murray, and we took Chris Dunn over Jamal Murray, Rashad McCants, all these guys. You know, we've made a lot of mistakes. There was Derek Williams, number two from Arizona. I mean, I, I don't think it was a great draft, but so we, so we gave up a lot of draft picks, but I want to make sure, you know, two years ago, we were trying to get help for cat up front, either a power forward. You know, he used to play with Taj Gibson, which was great. We need cat to have help rim protection. And the guy that they isolated two years ago was miles Turner. And I was like, Whoa, that would be pretty, pretty special. Right. Yeah, Miles Turner can can shoot. The problem is, is he almost duplicates a lot of stuff that Towns does, but he adds the shot blocking. But right. Miles Turner's been available for so long that it makes you wonder, like, what is the market for him? It seems that there's just not that many teams that are interested in him. Right. So keep going. But but Vando, Jared Vanderbilt, we all love. His I like en- Vando. Yeah, we all love his yeah. energy. He he he's not an offensive player. He can't dribble. He physically can't dribble or pass. No, I'm exaggerating. But he his heart was so big. He's six eight. Great rebounder, great defender. We're going to miss him. I don't think he's a starter necessarily. So as the Wolves are looking for Miles Turner or Clint Capella, I I heard Clint Capella. I was like, great. I need Cat to have some help. Hey, Ryan Rosillo, is Rudy Gobert better than Miles Turner and Clint Capella, sir? The stats will say that he is. Um, here's my problem. You're going to be paying him, what, $46, $47 million, and you never have to worry about him with the basketball. I don't care what A-Rod said last night at Summer League. um, What did he he say? I missed it. I I missed it. But I saw him with Steve Ballmer, but I I missed what what did he say. He suggested that his offense is actually a little underrated, and then he kind of didn't make a a great description of whatever. I don't know exactly what he was trying to say towards the end. I think he meant at the rim. His offense was a little underrated because the field goal percentage is so high. Uh, I'm with you on the draft picks. It's funny because I felt like for years I was the only one saying, hey, who cares when you trade these picks in the 20s? Like, look at the history of it. Yeah. Um, after yeah. pick 10, a lot of the times, I think it was something like 70% of the guys don't even get that second contract. Yeah. Uh, it's just the math doesn't work out. There's 450 players. You're not going to invite 45 new ones out of the 60 that are drafted. They're going to stick in the league. So if you're trading multiple picks in the 20s, you know, what are you really doing? Giving another team a one in three shot at a rotation player? Like, I don't want to mm-hmm. hear about the Draymond Greens. I don't want to hear about the Tony Parkers because of those, those are aberrations. And we, Manu we argue, Ginobili. Yeah, we argue Second the, round, yeah. The, the times were stuffed, you know. So I thought it was a combination of a draft capital overpay. But yes, I'm open to the idea there's a version of this with Minnesota where, you know, they're steady enough or maybe even better because I think the world of Anthony Edwards in that, hey, you know what? Those picks all said and done, it wasn't that big of a deal. Sure, there's there's a ver- but then you're still paying like 46 million for Rudy Gobert in three years when I think he is regressing a bit. Mm. And when I looked at Utah, a Utah team that I actually felt like I defended a lot, I'd look at their drop off from regular season defensive efficiency to playoff defensive efficiency, and it was significant some years and it was consistent all seven of the playoff years that they had Rudy it's not all on Rudy what he was asked to do against the Clippers two years ago protect the rim run to the corner 
That's hard right. for anybody to do. They went uh, 14 centers, of 19 on threes. Terrence Mann had a career game. They went 14 of 19 on threes. Yeah. Yeah, what, what do you mean? You know what's going on. What do you mean? There you are. You, are you mocking or are you saying yes? No, I mean, no, okay. no. I'm, you have to I'm shoot the lights locked, out. Yeah, you're you're locked into Clippers rotations, which I love about you. So uh, I'm telling, like, I don't want to hear it from any Timberwolves fans that I don't watch the team play. I am okay. probably the only national media guy who, in the preview of this upcoming season during the summer, was with Bill, and I'm going, hey, you know what? I watched a lot of T Wolves towards the end. I go, I think there's a little switch that's been turned on. I think there's a little aggressiveness coming out from them. Anthony Edwards is a must-watch for me. I just think it's a long-term bad deal with a guy right. who's becoming okay. an outdated player with today's game. So there you okay. go. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't, I don't concern myself unless I'm hired in the front office. I'm not really concerned about the contracts that these guys have. I do think he's going to age well. There are certain big men, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I think he'll age well. He takes care of his body. I think he'll be playing well in four years. That's my opinion. It's it's worth the risk. They. I, maybe the smaller markets have to take a risk. I say it's going to be either it's going to be good for the team, and I'm talking regular season. The playoffs to me are a different beast, and that's when you have to make adjustments. The playoff, the the regular season is going to be good or very good. I don't think it's going to be anything below that. And I I want you to know that the Wolves weren't sure if they could run it back with the same team with the tough West because obviously Kawhi was out. New Orleans is going to be better. They were in the play and they were in the seventh seed. They had a great year. So they took a risk. I also want you to know they, in, in the uh, organization, the guy that's the most liked and respected is Finchie, Chris Finch and Tim Connolly and these guys, they rod they all, and I say it too, Finchie will figure it out. And Jim Peterson, the color analyst and Finch, we trust. So, it wasn't a splash move by Mark Laurie. It was Chris Finch saying, if you can get Rudy Gobert, that's pretty amazing. That's a game changer. Now, where I disagree with you is on offense when you said, don't, I don't care about his 15 points a game. Those 15 points are counted in the final score. He averages more than Draymond Green. He averages Rodman. Did you hate Rodman and, and, and Draymond Green because they don't have to be guarded? Uh, Draymond is an incredible passer. Yes, he is. Can dribble, yes. can create, can do some stuff. Um, his shooting confidence is not the same. Uh, the basketball <laughs> is different now. You know, you could have two. I mean, think about what it was like when we grew up. We're like, okay, there's the score, and the point guard always passes it to the two guard as the score, and then maybe they're lucky enough that their power forward scores a little bit, or if it's not the power forward, it's their center that we post up, and then there's some white guy from Pepperdine who comes off the bench, and he hits two threes, and we're like, oh my God, this guy's the best shooter ever because he hits two of them. Again, I'm being a little facetious with the entire thing, but there were a number, there were a number of players on great basketball teams in the era that we grew up watching it where you never had five scores, you didn't have five decision makers, you didn't have five shot creators. Right. The best teams now make you stay honest with their spacing and having multiple offensive options. So Rudy is a massive, massive addition to any team's regular season. All right? Thank he you. is the plus Thank minus stuff. That's I've nice. seen it all. Let's, okay? There's the headline. That's what we need to – because who knows the matchup in the playoffs? We don't know what's going to sure. happen. But I do want you – one thing on the offense – you should not know this, and I didn't know this, and I was stunned. Finchie said it in an interview recently. Last Next year, time. I find this hard to believe. Last year, the Wolves had five lob passes for, for dunks, five lob passes, or for baskets. Three of them were on the fast break. Rudy had over 80 last year for the Jazz. Carl Towns, as gifted as he is, and I'm a, you know I'm a huge Carl Towns fan, he doesn't do lobs. He doesn't do lobs. That's not how he's built. You, you don't do a pick and roll and lob it up to him. Remember how Chris Paul used to do it with Tyson Chandler down in New Orleans? It was like, how or do you DeAndre defend DeAndre Jordan. It done, yeah. yeah, exactly. So Rudy brings that element now. And that is that is on the offensive end, just to let you know, Ryan. That is an offensive play to throw a lob pass and dunk the ball for two points. That's Rudy on offense. Because you would say, you don't have to guard him. And if you don't have to guard him, then Finchie's going to have him roll right to the rim. And and. uh I, I, I get know. I get it. I understand okay. how the lob works. And now he'll be with a team maybe that doesn't 
want to just freeze them out of their own offense, which felt like that was happening at times in Utah. I get get all of those things. But all I'm telling you is that if you're in the playoffs and the other team goes small and nobody's defending Gobert like we've seen the last couple, and then you have a non-offensive threat out there in a playoff series, or if in a couple years from now one of those picks ends up being good because somebody else gets hurt, and then you're like, what, we're paying Rudy Gobert? He picked up his player option for $46 million, 25, 26. Like there's, you know, I I don't know. Like I've cooled on Gobert. I've cooled on Gobert. Okay, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it works out. I think it's going to be very positive. I obviously understand the playoffs are a different story because, of course, Memphis benched Stephen Adams against the Wolves because he couldn't guard Carl Towns. So I understand the playoffs are a different beast. One more thing on the T-Wolves. I like D'Lo. I'm kind of come around to D'Lo. Now, let me just tell you something. Oh, this, this podcast, uh, we were going to this... trade D'Lo, and I and I identified him as problematic. He's not a max player, I, and I'm not an Andrew Wiggins fan. He's not a ball player; he doesn't handle the ball. I'm happy for him. He's I will say he's a better pro than D'Lo, but you know he's a good defender. He, I'm happy what he won a championship. His his game doesn't do it for me, and he can't dribble and pass. D'Lo's a ball player, streak shooter, major streak shooter. He had the best game uh, in the playing game against the Clippers. He had 29, and that's when they doubled up Towns and took him out of the game. And then he got shellacked in the Memphis series. He had played well against Memphis in the regular season, but Dylan Brooks was out. Dylan Brooks deed him up in the playoffs. We were going to trade him. My whole thing was, who's the point guard next year? He better be more talented than D'Lo. And they're going to keep D'Lo, is my understanding. And I'm excited. For a couple reasons. He can pass, man. He can pass. When he's not shooting well, which is unfortunately for a pure shooter like me too often, that guy can pass. What are your thoughts on D'Lo? I know he's mercurial. He's eccentric. He's a, he does things. This is what bothers the Wolves. He'll call in and say, I, I can't play tonight. I know my body. Like He'll be dinged up and miss a big game. That's what bothers. Yeah, there was some, there was some injury stuff the previous year that I, I got the sense didn't go over really well. Right. Um, Right. With the team. I'm not going to argue on the talent. You know, and I would watch him and get ready because I did the draft that year. And I did the way this kid sees the game, you know, the tempo that he plays at, some of the passes that he sees that other players just aren't going to see was all really, really impressive. Um, But I feel like the Nets had this weird string of they had Russell, they had Dinwiddie, and they had Karis Levert, where they were like, (laughs) do you want to just do everything on our own and never pass? (laughs) Right, right, right. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm not saying he he can't pass. He's capable. Of, I think he gets a little too single minded. Yeah. And I felt like at times I could sense Anthony Edwards bringing the ball up in transition being like, you just you just had two possessions, man. Like I'm yeah. taking this one. And right. I think I'm better than you. And look, I think I would agree with Anthony Edwards on that one where I thought it was a little concerning on that disconnect. I think there have been times where he's atrocious defensively which right. to me is selfish in basketball. Right. Like all you have to do is care enough about what the assignment is right. and understand what the assignment is to just be an average defensive player. Right. When you're a minus, I think that's on you just not caring. So I think there were moments, I would agree, Craig, that you felt a little bit better about it, but the, it has to be this kind of reined in version of him that's also maybe a little bit more willing to defer to Edwards, who I think is the more talented player. Oh, Edwards, here's the here's the... The, the elephant in the room for me with D'Lo is he's not a good athlete. He's not, he's just not physically strong. He's so he, what he is, is crafty. He's crafty, crafty. I like, you know, how guys, they move at their own speed. Paul Pierce moves at his own speed. Very crafty. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's his thing because he's you know not, he doesn't he jump played. to the moon. It's a rarity when he dunks. I've seen him dunk a little bit. We all kind of giggle. He barely gets over the rim. So he's, he sees the game. He has a good feel for the game. My question is, is and I, I'm going to ask Finchie this if he comes on. Can you improve guys' shooting? Because I think his backspin is not proper. That's why he's not pure. I, I think his shoots a dead ball or not enough spin because he is so streaky. It's ridiculous. Anyway, we're going to shift gears after you're done here. I'm going to shift to something. We're going. We're getting off hoop. So tell me when you're ready. Do you want to say anything else about D'Lo? How many think he get a game in Luxembourg? <laughs> he would average like forty, at least forty-one. I mean, at least. That guy, the, one, 40, the thing he does, the thing he's done does that is stylish and is dramatic. And this is not about winning basketball, but he will pull up when he's not supposed to from 30 feet 
and his arc is so high, it's a rainbow arc, that it's it's exhilarating as a fan when it goes in. It's like, oh my, he just pulled up from 30. Now, when other guys do that, I'm like, that's a bad shot. I accept Dame Dollar doing it and D'Lo doing it. Pulling up from way out and launching. That's a stylish you know what point. Is, you, you know this, though. Um, because it, had he played in Luxembourg, he may have fit in because the country's <laughs> motto is, we want to stay what we are. <laughs> Now, how do you know that? Oh, yeah, I see what you're doing. That's so great. That is, oh, what a pro. What a pro. Okay, so we're, we got to hustle here. We're going to do uh, a segment called Lord Kilby Leadership. This is where I share my wonderful taste. And in the process, we learn more about Ryan Rossillo and his mellifluous voice. So these are just, these are just a couple things. Favorite pie. Favorite pie. Didn't even have to think about it when I got the assignment. Key lime pie. Oh, thank you. Uh, I believe it's my friend Ian Rappaport who says key lime pie is not a pie, and he's wrong. I love key lime pie. I would say, and I accept that as a great answer. I like pumpkin pie. I used to, as a kid, like coconut cream pie. But key lime pie is right there with pumpkin pie. Very good. I think it it's almost like a palate cleanser. Yeah. You know, not like, yeah. not well, like, like sorbet uh, or something. Yeah, it's tart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you get that. You get a little spoonful of Sri Lankan ginger pressed into something in between your courses at the estate. But I always feel like afterwards, it's the dessert that actually makes me feel a little bit lighter. And when it's right, it's a, yeah. I don't need it to be huge. I don't need too right. much. Yeah, uh, It to me is the perfect, perfect when it's done well. I might get a slice tonight just thinking about it. Oh, I like months. you more than I did before because I was... I, I, I thought you might say, I don't know, boysenberry, which is the, the number one selling pie over here at the farmer's market at Dupar's is boysenberry with a, a la mode with a scoop. But key lime is great. Next question. Best James Bond actor. Best James Bond actor. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we're doing this. Um, is that hard? I think it is hard. I mean, it is and it isn't. You have to say Connery. I think you have to say Connery, but Roger Moore was terrific. All right. And then you're thinking like, am I leaving Pierce Bronson out of the conversation? And I'll tell you, I thought George Lazenby was terrific in Honor of Majesty's Secret Service. He only got one shot at it. And apparently he had a little Bob Evans in him as well. Um, but maybe it was, he wasn't as nice as Bob Evans. I've re, I've re, I go back and read that Lazenby profile every now and then. And I'm just oh, like, yeah. this guy was a real rascal. There are people that don't think Bob Evans was a nice guy, but that's okay. Uh, That's, it's a cutthroat business. His, obviously. his friends seem to like him a lot. Bob right. Evans. They were it's loyal very clear. Right. The loyal, the loyalty right. was strong with the people that he was loyal to. So um, I'm going to go Connery because I just, I can't, okay. I can't okay. not, I, I just don't think you can say anyone else despite an incredibly challenging field. So what I did, you might call a cop out. I did a tie. I did a yes. tie with Sean Connery because he's the man, as we all know, and Daniel Craig. I think Daniel Craig did an amazing job. Roger Moore, I liked when I was growing up, and he's good looking, and he also played the saint. But those were kind of cheesy James Bonds. And so I'm going uh, Daniel Craig tie with Sean Connery. Okay? I don't I don't like the tie, but I mean, they're, they're all, cop out. they're actually all really good. I mean, Dalton was a little darker, so some people didn't love that. Moore right. got a little cartoonish, but that's, that's more what of a director's choice. Yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. director's choice. Right. But when... Connery really starts to feel himself. I think Goldfinger's everybody's every, you know, the kind of the standard, right? Everybody, usually most people will argue, hey, I like Goldfinger the best. The weird thing is, is I like, my favorite Bond movie might be one of the ones that people like the least and doesn't even have Connery in it. And that's the man with the golden gun. For whatever reason, I just love the music for that one. It was right. terrific. But when he's in Thunderball, you can see like Connery really feeling himself. Um, I, I just love those movies. And I'm not, I'm not surprised to see that you appreciate him as well. Yeah, I and Daniel, I like Skyfall. Uh, man, let me just look something up here. Casino uh, Royal's terrific. Yeah, that's that's the high, that's a high rated one. It's even higher rated than. Uh, okay, uh, next, uh, it's higher rated than Skyfall. Favorite childhood soda pop. We called it soda pop back in Minnesota. Soda. Favorite childhood soda pop. 
We didn't get a lot of soda. We didn't get a lot of soda back at the pad. So like every now and then we get some like spritzer thing going on, which I don't think is entirely fair. You know, it was organic or whatever. And then I remember one time my parents were big on this, this water. It was called vine. It was a vineyard thing. And it was like the most, it was soda water, but it wasn't really. And then it had the smallest hint of grape and it sucked. It was awful and it wasn't fun. And we were kids and we're like, this isn't cool. So when we were allowed to have it, my sister, this is very cool of her, my awesome sister, on my birthday last summer, she sent me a case of organic grape soda because when it was, we were little kids and we were, we were right. venturing out, you know, we would do the pizza and then the cups and grape soda with pizza. Mm. That was the best. Yeah. Grape soda. Grape soda was strong. We, we actually had a, uh, we, it was called Heidi High Pop. It was, a, my neighbor owned it and they had all, they had, they had uh, cherry cola, they had all the, all the, they had orange and we would, my dad, we would put ice cream. So we'd make a float. Obviously root beer was the go-to thing, root beer float, but we would make an orange, like a creamsicle float with orange soda and vanilla ice cream. Grape was stunning and it was amazing. Uh, what was the other one? Was it black cherry? What was the one that was like Dr. Pepper? I think it was the black cherry. For whatever reason, and I'm a little embarrassed, but you don't have great taste. I liked something as a child called cream soda. You ever heard of cream soda? Yeah, of course. I mean, didn't, okay. didn't hires also make a cream soda along with their very probably. successful root beer line? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just thought it was interesting. I, I'll be stunned if anyone, if I ask anyone, you know, if they say something called cream soda was my favorite because I just, my grandfather you realize had- that people- People have heard of cream soda. Okay, like, I didn't know. You're, you're, you know why I say that? I say that, this is why I say that. I'm on the West Coast and there's a, this uh, ex-girlfriend of mine, like she had a sweet tooth and I would name things. And I don't know if she was playing a game. Uh, peanut brittle, what's peanut brittle? Or what's what's English toffee? Let's go have some. Like, so I think I would just, but I said an ice cream that I found Where out was, was just- from? <laughs> like the North Pole? I, I said an ice cream that was popular in the Midwest that no one's heard about here. It's called Butter Brickle. Butter Brickle. And it was like butter pecan. So you've never heard of Butter Brickle ice cream, have you or not? No, but I saw your Instagram post. where I, was, that a, was that a cone of Butter Brickle? Were you being naughty, No, Craig? that was that was Princess Cherry, my significant other. She had salted caramel and she had chocolate. She's a chocolate freak. And I was holding it for the post. I had one little... I don't want to say nibble. lick that. I don't like saying the word lick. I had one little taste of of her cone and took a picture, and then I got out of there. Get the hell out! Yeah, of I don't. There. I don't think I like the word lick. Now that you say it, I might try to remove that from the vocabulary. But what you're basically telling us, which we're we're learning, and I know you, we're done here soon, is that you are a combination of Midwest values with Hollywood influence. Yeah, or classic influences. I like old Hollywood. It might, you'll see that yeah. as we get to the top five movies. And I, I can't wait to hear yours because I've been doing it with friends for 30 years around dinner, favorite movies of all time. I like to see if there's an overlap. I like to guess sometimes. Like I always think people are going to say Goodfellas because it's very popular. Maybe it's on your list and it's good if it is. We're not there yet. Favorite Italian dish. Favorite Italian dish. Uh, w- without question, I'll get chicken parm. Okay. Almost anywhere okay. I go. Right. I know it's okay. basic as hell, but yeah. I just got done. I went to RPM Italian twice in Las Vegas. I went two okay. out of three nights just for the chicken parm. Okay. I never order. I know it's great. I never order it. I get veal, scallopini, veal marsala. Uh, I don't eat pasta, but I like linguine con vongole. I love bolognese. I like pesto sauce. I talked about that. I make a great uh, chicken milanese. Oh. Yeah. Do you pound Light. it? Or, do you pound the chicken there, sir? Or not? You don't no, pound you it. have to. Yeah. No, because you got to know you got to know your temperatures. Anybody knows that. You got to know your temperatures. You got to cook evenly. You don't want it too crispy. You know, you start dealing with chicken that's like unevenly cooked. I mean, you know, don't even invite anybody over the house. Two more questions on Lord Kilby leadership. This is going very well with Ryan Rosillo. If you're just joining us, it's seventy five. That would be weird. And yeah, that'd be weird on a podcast. <laughs> seventy five and seventy fifty. <laughs> uh, I don't like the F word. Am I square? Most people in America love the F word. I don't, I don't like it. I never used it on the air where I knew they're going to bleep me. I just don't, I think, I think it's low class, but everyone else uses it. I'll occasionally use it in my private life, but I don't like the word. Am I a square, sir? If I didn't know you, I would say yes. But since I feel like I know you a little bit, it just, it fits the brand. It's like a regal thing. It's beneath you. Thank you. I love it. Thank you. 
but I I, I approve of your disdain. Or you love it that I don't like it, or you love the word. Both. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Okay, finally, uh, before we before we get to the top five movies, best calves, best calves, Brad Pitt, Aaron Rodgers, Ryan Rossillo, best calves. Take your time. Okay, let's do a little research here. I'm pretty sure it's going to be me, but I just want to make sure that it's not. And to be honest, no to be honest with you, I think your yours are better than Brad Pitt's. Yeah, I would be shocked if Brad Pitt, unless he's one of those freaky genetic guys, you know, like Ray Allen. They used to joke that he had tennis yeah, balls stuck. Yeah, he had yeah. very muscular calves. Mine are similar to Michael Jordan's, except he jumps higher. Um, so I, I'll give you the answer. It's actually Aaron Rodgers. Have you seen? You know, I, I'm on it now. It, I think it might be him. Yeah. Yeah, I they're pretty. Him. Yeah, they're huge. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Mine are not small, Craig. I know. Mine I know are not that. small. I thought his, you would think it was I, you and yours. I did. Let, let's just say yours are perfect and his are, you know, kind of freakish. He's, He's got more, the longer ones. I have yeah. like the two things and then there's a cliff. His his are longer. Do you um, remember that night we took pictures of your calves? I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Now, I here's thought, what I we thought do. we hired someone to take the pictures. <laughs> yes. And we had the makeup lady there. Uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to finish up with top five movies of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to remember living lavishly is an important part of the life gorgeous, and when you live well, it can cost you. But have no fear, Lord Kilby has a solution. Zell. I think it's kind of obvious that I eat out a lot. I go to French restaurants and sometimes my friends pick up the bill and that's a no-no. So afterwards I look them in the eye, I shake their hand and I say, I'm gonna send you some money through Zelle. I ordered a lot of food tonight. Other times we'll go down to the park and have a barbecue. We all pitch in afterwards. I use Zelle. I send hundreds of dollars to my friends. It's who I am. It's kind of a rush. I'm down at the park, I'm wearing linen, I'm at a barbecue and I'm sending people money through Zelle. I like Zell. I like giving back. <sighs> Remember, money sent goes straight into the recipient's bank account, typically in minutes between enrolled users. And best yet, you don't have to download another app because it's probably already in your banking app. So go on, look for Zell in your banking app today. And you're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Rosillo. Ryan, I gave you this assignment. Was it difficult? Because I always tell people, just do a list. You can change it five minutes later. I know it's tough. Well, it is difficult because there's so much art that I love. There's a lot of art inside of me. I hope so. there's not, I hope that's not. A, I used to say to people, because you just went artsy. I don't want any foreign movies, if that's okay. I just want to, is that okay? Oh, this isn't top five foreign movies? No. I mean, it so could be bicycle you know, thieves. It could be, it could be whatever you want. I shouldn't say that because I, if I have a, a British movie, I guess that you know. So I, yeah, it's it's all good. Well, now I had no, Cleo no, from top five, five to seven. Movie, no, top five of all time, and you can have two honorable mentions. Go ahead. Okay, the, the floor right, is yours. Uh, you want me to go first, then? Yes, right, sir. Gonna, I don't want to intimidate you with my list. This is not going to be anyone's favorite movie. It's not even going to be in anyone's top five. Um, but Bottle Rocket is my mm. favorite movie. Good for you. Uh, Wes Anderson's first uh, first swing at it. It made me want to write. Uh, granted, it, it took me a little while, time-wise, to, to be inspired enough to write, a couple decades. But I loved what it was. I loved that it was, you know, a lot of people have a concept. Like, hey, let's have these guys, and they, they want to do these things, but they're offbeat. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, but then what? And then right. how does it end? What's and the story? All the, and it's, right. And, I thought the innocence of it all and, and everybody kind of being new on the scene. And then basically you knew once Wes Anderson wrote that, you're like, okay, I can't wait to see what this guy does next. But Bottle Rocket, the first time I saw it, it had a little bit of everything. It was funny. It had a heart. It was, I mean, I wouldn't say it was suspenseful necessarily <laughs> with the big thing at the end, uh, but it's, it's my favorite movie. It's my favorite movie. And I know I'm not supposed to pick it, but I am. 
I did. And by the way, when I did the, when we do the top five list, there's, there's no, uh, I usually don't say you don't have to have an order, but you're saying, are you going in order? Was that, is that like your number one of all time? Or is that what you're saying? I felt like I have to pick the one that I, you know, if I was going to go okay. first, that's one. And the rest of them are in order. So there okay, you go. cool. Here we go. Keep going. You go, you give all five at once. Fargo. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love Good that movie. the Coen brothers start the movie with screwing with everyone. Based on based on a true story, it isn't, which I right. didn't know until years I know later. it is. It is. It makes it it makes it more significant that it's based on a true story, and then years later, or I don't know how long after, they said no, no, we just it was bits and pieces of things we heard or something. Yeah, there was there was some. If you go back and research all of it, there are some things that they're they're kind of picking from, right? Um, but to have the Jerry Lundegaard character where you actually feel so terrible for this man who's done all of these things that have set this absolute chaos in motion. Right. Um, William H. Macy. That's a very hard thing to do. And sometimes as the audience, the first time we're introduced to the character, we sort of default towards rooting for that person because it's the first person that we're interested or introduced to. Right. But he's, he's an awful dude. He's an awful guy. And when he's getting dragged, spoiler alert, I think, what, 26 years later, um, 20, 28, maybe um, when he's being dragged from the hotel, I feel bad for him. And there's no right. reason that I should feel bad for him. And whether it's the Bashemi stuff, whether it's the father. Right. And then it's the Coen Brothers dialogue, which is right. unmatched and, and unique. Right. And so Fargo for me is always, always going to be one when it's That's a on. good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay, uh, keep going here. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I was going to put for Unforgiven in there because I love the arc of what Eastwood is. You know, he's cleaning up his act and then his buddy gets screwed with and he's like, yeah. give me the whiskey and give me the guns. And I ins instead, because I wasn't going to go two Westerns, Good, the Bad, the Ugly is just awesome. The yeah. music, everybody kind of knows what it is. The impact of that movie in the Spaghetti Westerns, that movie, that, that movie means a lot. Like everyone right. knows what that movie is. Are you a Clint fan? Because I'm a Clint fan and I was fortunate to know his his ex-wife and we had dinner a few times. I keep saying that, but it's true. And 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 former late night host can name drop. But I knew Clint. I and, want more of it. No one should be well, apologizing. But but Unforgiven is what some people think is his is his best film. I like Dirty Harry. And I did uh, someone made me recently do my top five movies since the year 2000. And I said Grand Torino. Uh get off my lawn. But Clint is pretty special. I, I also, have you ever seen In the Line of Fire with Malkovich and Clint? Are you kidding? I love that movie. Uh, so yeah, I'm a Clint are, guy. Yeah. Yeah. Those are movies. They're these movies that aren't super high rated. They're on IMDb. They're over sevens. And they're like, there are a couple that I can watch. I don't watch the classics over and over. I, I space them out. But certain movies like The Firm, which is 6.8, No Way Out, In the Line of Fire, I'll watch those all the time. Malkovich dominates in that movie. Okay, this one's another one, but this reminds is this, me. Is this your the, third or fourth? What did you? You got this is uh, this is number four. I got two more. Okay. I got two more. Okay, because you know, look, I love The Godfather. I love Godfather Two. Goodfellas deserves to be on there. I always kind of have like a little love for Inception because it blew my mind as the first Christopher Nolan one, where I was like, okay, this guy's different. And then right. you think about what they did with Memento and all that different stuff. I'm not, but I'm, I have to be honest. I have to be true to myself, Craig. <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life is a great movie. Oh, classic, okay. classic. And it reminds me of, of home. It reminds me of, of the anticipation of Christmas. It reminds me of youth. It reminds me of, hey, it's on. Let's do grapes. this. Which It reminds you of grape soda and pizza and your yeah, happy yeah. childhood. It's awesome. And, and yeah. Jimmy Stewart in that movie is like, those guys were rock stars. Like, granted, yes, I know it's different with the top, but but how great all of those people were at the top of their game back then. Right. Like, I mean, imagine, imagine like somebody in a blog criticizing Jimmy Stewart's performance <laughs> after that movie being like, I know. Yeah. You know, I don't know that he was truly detached enough. Was he as confused as you would be in that scenario? You know? And right. all right. So that's, <laughs> la that's it. Uh, last one. I'm going go. with another Wes, another Wes Anderson. Rushmore is a perfect movie. Right. A lot of people love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. And to figure out a way to do a love triangle that was absurd. <laughs> a prep school kid, Bill Murray, yeah, yeah. on yeah. his way out. And and the teacher that at some point maybe screws with the kid's head enough that it's a possibility. 
Right. And the, the beginning lines that Anderson writes in that movie where he was like, she's like, oh, I studied at Oxford. And he's like, oh, that, how, what a coincidence. The, uh, <laughs> oh, no, she says I went to Harvard, right? And he's like, oh, Harvard and Sorbonne were my safeties. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. It's, no, people, the, people love that one. They love that. They love the uh, Royal Tannenbaums and they love Rushmore. Yeah. So there okay. you go. I got two Wes Andersons in there. Uh, even though I like Bottle Rocket better, I think right. Rushmore is the perfect movie. And it's a great ending to something that usually is very hard to end properly. Okay. I'm going to quickly do my five. I just like to see if there's an overlap. I like to see if you've seen any of these. I do old school stuff. Uh, I'm a Hitchcock fanatic. My whole life, I've been a Hitchcock fanatic. I'm going to only name one of his movies, even though I love them all, or most of them. I'm going to just name North by Northwest with Cary Grant. I love Strangers on a Train. I love Psycho. And the list goes on and on. Hitchcock, North by Northwest, number, no order. Here's one that's unbelievable. The Graduate. Great soundtrack. Great movie. One of my favorites. Chinatown. One of my favorites. I like film noir from the 40s and 50s. This was a film noir from the 70s. Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, Bob Evans. Sunset Boulevard with Billy Wilder, who wrote that. And uh, that's one of my favorites. I think that's four. And then for my fifth, I I kind of rotate movies. I used to have Tootsie in there, but I'm going to put a movie that doesn't really belong in the top five, but it is, it meant a lot to me. I saw it in 2004. I rewatched it a year ago and I currently have it in my top five sideways. What a great list. Uh, sideways is awesome. Yeah. Isn't I, it? And, and, How many times have you seen it? it? Okay. When it first came out, yeah. I didn't like it. Oh, really? I was too young. Okay. Okay. I was too young. And then as a, as a guy who's been on television and, and felt the highs, of the highs, and then ending up at a weird apartment, you know, in some wine trip, I was like, I get it. Yeah. Now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's funny. And the, and the combination of, the, of, you know, Giamatti's character just lying to oh. himself, lying oh to himself God. the entire time. That is a beautiful script movie oh, execution. Yeah. I was too young to appreciate what depths they were diving into there. Yeah, I was stunned at, you know, it's again, these are movies that the these guys would even be friends and they said, well, they were college roommates because they were such opposites and Giamatti was so depressed and down and drunk dialing his ex-wife. And then I just laughed at Thomas Hayden Church because he was such a horn dog, you know, just, he, he, he meets, he sees Virginia Madsen as the waitress. He goes, you know her? She's jamming. I mean, he was so simplistic and shallow with his, his, uh, he was a sex freak. I mean, it was it was just, and then Giamatti has to watch this and put up with this, and I just thought it was hilarious. And then he drops him off back at the house, and yeah. it's, it was that was that was perfect because you're like, wait, you're going to get away with all of this? And it's like, yeah, yes. And I do love. I mean, I'm kind of a sucker for love stories and romance, and it's it's easy. But I love the final scene where he's listening to the voicemail and driving in the rain to knock on her door. That's beautiful, isn't it, Brian? Oh yeah, no, it's perfect because you. You, you want something to go right for him because nothing's going right. And then there's different levels to it. And I think he, there was like real animosity towards the friend of being like, you acted like a complete asshole then screwed right. my thing up because you lied the whole time. And then I'm just going to drop you off back at your house ahead of your wedding. And that's yeah. it. That's just it. And then when he's drinking the wine and eating a yes. burger by himself, Love that don't waste, that's... don't wait with these great bottles of wine. Do it, have that moment and do it right now. I love that. I did. I, I just had to clean up one thing because it was going to drive me really crazy yes. until, you know, the next time I would come the on. Perfectionist, when, the perfectionist, the perfection. I know. But in Rushmore, he says, oh, what a coincidence. Uh, I'm applying to Oxford and the Sorbonne. Harvard is my safety. They're, that would make way more sense. I was sense surprised people... that you screwed that up and I was going to let it go. That was a joke. I am surprised and I knew I did. And then I, just, I was like, I need to fix this. I, I'm just kidding. Uh, we are at the end of uh, my, my conquistador lamps can stay warm for a while, but then I got to put the kerosene back in there. So thank you, sir. That was enjoyable in a few weeks or so, uh, whenever I, I want to promote my, my new, uh, sir, Craig Kilborn YouTube channel, I'll come on your uh, podcast, try to tell that Bob Evans story, but thank you for, uh, for doing this. I appreciate it. This is a big deal for me and my friends that know me know this is a big deal because, uh, and as I've told you both on and off the air, uh, when I was interning in the late 90s, I was like, I want to be like that guy. And 
then after I interned there, I was like, maybe I don't want it to be an anchor. I don't think I'm going to be an anchor. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think a lot like you, where you're like, yeah, maybe I don't need to do this either <laughs> in different you stops. You know, I, I did have a note that I didn't even get to. I was going to say at the top, is this the greatest time of your life professionally? I mean, you have so much freedom and success with your podcast, but there's no executive you know, any, any problems from management? I mean, is, is it the greatest time of your life professionally? Not until I get something else accomplished that I'm working on. So okay. yeah, the freedom and the success and that part of it's terrific, but there's another level that I'm, I'm fighting for here. And, and, you know, I'd, I'd say, I hope to get there, but I don't want to sound like a dick, no right. offense, but I just, I'm a I'm, jerk. We say jerk where I'm from. Yeah. I'm expecting, I'm expecting another level at some point. Good. I'll be honest. And Good maybe for you. it's just a standard that I'm holding myself to. But yeah, I'll say yes to it hopefully soon. You know, some of the people listening say, Craig, why don't you do a follow-up and ask him what he's trying to do? Well, he's told me off off camera, and I know, and I like him to keep it private and go for it. And he's a very talented young man. And, and I love that he's driven. We're all driven. It's not, we don't have to talk about it, but I know what you're doing. You're a talented guy and you're an excellent writer. And I'm proud of you. And it's great to see you, brother. Hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciated this. And we'll We're, get together again soon. Ryan Rasilla, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> ladies and gentlemen, one of the great features of the Life Gorgeous podcast is me, your dear friend, answering questions and helping you. You guys can leave a voicemail at the YouTube channel, Sir Craig Kilborn. Ask me a question. Just say hi. Let's answer some questions. And here is question number one. <laughs> Ah, uh, Lord Kilby, I come to you from the beaches of Venice where I care for my three children, splashing about in the waves under the bright sun. Uh, I know I should be in the office editing or writing or generally suiting up whatever this show has become, but I really can't be bothered. Craig, am I doing it right, or uh, would you suggest I get back to work hard on growing the Craigers brand? Sincerely yours, Gabe. Hey, Gabe, nice to hear your voice. Good question. I recommend for most human beings to work. Stay out of trouble. Feel good about yourselves. Um, I'm a little different breed of cat. I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish. I'm happily retired, but I do still work or have a hobby. I like to write. I like to post on my Instagram, which is changing people's lives. Uh, changing people's lives. And uh, so I would say for most people, it's good to work. For me, I'm a little different, but I am working hard. I have two homes, upkeep with them, and I write a lot. Good question. And we go to the next one. Lord Gilby. I'm your fan from New Delhi, India, and my question to you is, what inspires your erotic breath? P.S. I can't wait to smell the pages of your upcoming book. Peace. So I'm assuming you said erotic breath. Um, that's what I think I heard. But what inspires me? I'm just going to take it. I'm going to interpret the question the way I want to. Uh, music inspires me. I listen to Bill Evans jazz. I don't force that on a lot of people. It's uh, not what they want to hear, but it's beautiful music. I listen to it in the morning over coffee. I try to feed my soul creativity. So that's music, literature, turning a phrase, well-crafted sentences, and also watching classic movies. And that's why on every one of my podcasts, I'll be asking the guests their top five movies of all time. Those are the kind of things that inspire me. There's a long list, but off the top of my head, it's about being creative. Next question. Thank you. Hi, Lord Kilby. Mike from Kettering, Ohio here. What beverage is your favorite while watching sports in your mahogany panel den? And does that favorite drink change depending on what sport you're viewing? I'll hang up now and listen for your reply. No, Mike, stay on the phone. Stay on. No, that's good that you hang up. That's what you're supposed to do. Uh, good question. I 
drink red wine during sporting events, and I'll tell you why. I only have a martini once a week, so I either drink red wine or a martini. But you don't want to drink a martini during a game because the game's NBA two and a half hours, football three hours. So red wine, preferably California Cab, is my choice in my mahogany panel den. I usually sit right over here, big screen over there, and I watch the Minnesota Vikings beat the Packers. I watch the Timberwolves beat the Clippers in the play-in game. That was fun. Good question, and let's go to the next one. Here we go. We're on a roll. Hey, Craig. Long-time masturbator, first-time caller. Craig, I do actually have two serious questions for you. Number one would be on your old CBS show. I'm curious if any particular guest as a person struck you as being unmistakably sweet, unmistakably kind, like, for example, in your behind-the-scenes interaction with them. Totally separate question. I'm also curious if you ever found yourself um, thinking to yourself while looking at a guest oh my God, this person in person is way, way, way more beautiful than I ever would have pictured or imagined. And if that is the case, I'm curious who that person or persons uh, might have been. Okay. All right. Thank you, my friend. Bye, Googie. Okay. Thank you for your question. You had two, a two-parter. Uh, let me get rid of the fur, the, the, the latter, the, uh, the beautiful person. Catherine Zeta-Jones was stunning in person. Now, all the women were stunning. This was right before she started dating Michael Douglas, and she was very stunning in person. Uh, as far as nice behind the scenes, uh, Ted Danson, we used to chit chat uh, behind the scenes. We talk about health. We're not smoking too many cigars. You know, we would talk about that. And he was, he's a thin man. I'm thin. And uh, I remember one of my producers who was a bit of a malcontent said, Ted Danson says you're a sweet man. I said, I am a sweet man to Ted Danson, to nice people. But anyway, so I would say Ted Danson and uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones was stunning. Uh, I think that's enough for questions today. Unless you want to do one, I'll do one more, one more question. Hey, Craig, one of your biggest fans here. Question, when you graduated from college in the 80s and moved to San Francisco, what was your favorite song that summer? I think it was in uh, 85 or so. Do you have a go-to song? I think I know the answer. Thanks, man. Proud of you. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I like you. Uh, yeah, it was my song. I was I graduated from Montana State. I lived with my brother up on Knob Hill in San Francisco. And the song now is, of course, a big hit. But back then it was a big hit. It was my favorite song. It was called Running Up That Hill, Kate Bush. And I was in San Francisco and that was my song. Man. And now I'm so glad that everyone has rediscovered it. Thanks for your questions. Remember, ask questions. We'll uh, answer them at the Sir Craig Kilborn YouTube channel. Subscribe. And I'm here to help. And that's uh, very exciting. Great episode today. We'll see you next time on The Life Gorgeous. And remember, I'm proud of you. <laughs>